So transitioning in ag business is a complex topic because it really brings into play a, a number of different issues that to deal with. And on one hand, there, there are complex financial and legal issues to consider, but there's also a human side, sometimes an emotional aspect to transitioning a business, regardless if it's a farm business or not. So I do think there are some unique considerations that come into play in transitioning a farm business. And certainly this webinar isn't going to provide all the answers, but in order to overcome the challenges or hurdles, it's important to know what they are. And so today we're gonna to identify some of those and hopefully provide some ideas at least to get started on that path. To do that, we're fortunate to have with us today someone who's helped a number of farm businesses work through these issues. John Jaffe is a business consultant based in our Dayville, Connecticut office, but he works with businesses across New England and New York. He brings a great background and perspective to this issue. Uh, he's a native of upstate New York and a graduate of Cornell, and John operated his own dairy farm for a few years, so he's been on the producer side of the table. Since then, for 34 years, John served in a number of roles at Farm Credit East as a loan officer in branch management and as a tax specialist, and now as a farm business consultant. In his current role, he works with members on a strategic business analysis, tax consulting, and of course, succession and estate planning. John has led and taught a number of seminars and classes on these subjects, and he's very active in the ag and local community, serving on the advisory board for groups such as the CARE Project, the Rhode Island Ag Council, uh, the Cape Cod Cranberry Growers, and the Plymouth Chapter of Habitat for Humanity. So before I turn it over to John for his presentation, here's a slide with a legal disclaimer. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to John for his presentation. Well, thank you very much, Tom. I appreciate the kind words, the compliments, um, and look forward to the, speaking at this webinar. Um, Tom had indicated that this is one of my focuses that, that is out there, and I would say at this stage, I'm probably spending two-thirds of my time on this farm transition uh, planning of the businesses. To get a sense of how active that's been over the last year, uh, in the last year, I've spoken at a couple national conferences, one in Denver, one in Las Vegas, I've had the opportunity to speak at local conferences in Albany, Springfield, and Manchester, New Hampshire. Um, I've taught actually farm, uh, six farm succession schools uh, in all six states in New England. Uh, I've worked with hundreds of farm operations all over the uh, New England area over the last few years, and currently have about 30 to 40 ongoing farm succession um, uh, plans in route right now. Um, for the webinar today, I'm planning to use a number of stories to illustrate uh, some of the points that I'm gonna be making. And I'm gonna be focusing on the five hurdles uh, that are needed to go from thinking about the idea of transitioning in the farm to making a successful uh, transition. So think of it as a race. You have to go one hurdle at a time. If one hurdle stops you, you have to start and go again. But the goal is to go over all five uh, hurdles. Uh, can you switch the, to the next slide, please? All right, uh, what is the issue? The issue out there is that roughly one third of the principal farmers that are out there in New England are over 65 years old. Further, 62% are 55 plus. What this is gonna mean is over the next 15 years, about 1 million acres within New England will likely be transferred from one generation to, to the next. A lot of acres, an awful lot of farms. And furthermore, 90% of, uh, of these farm operations don't have a young farmer, which we define as under 45, involved to take it over. The biggest challenge is hard to get landowners to talk about it. As I just mentioned, I've uh, spoken at a lot of some national conferences, some local conferences, done webinars, done local presentations, um, and have had a fair amount of interest in those. So from a conference standpoint, we get lots of people saying this is a really important issue. We need to talk about it. We need to do something on our farm. From there, we go down to a general inquiry. Somebody will call me and say, do you do a farm succession? Do you do estate planning? Do you do this type of work? That shrinks the number that are there. Some people will follow up with it, some people won't. We then go down to an actual meeting where somebody has called me up and said, I'm in my 60s, I need to make a transition, I need to do something, can you help me? That's the next step of an actual meeting. From there, I have had a number of meetings. Some have uh, gone forward successfully and some of them have not. Uh, I was talking to one of my recent uh, consultants, another one that, who's done the same type of work, and we figured that of the people that we've met with and put together a plan, probably about 40 to 50% uh, ultimately go to the succession of this plan. So hot topic, but trying to get people to go from 
thinking about it, uh, considering it to actually going forward, that is a, has been a challenge. So it's a big issue. People are getting older. The farms that need to transition are more and more critical to do it. Let's move forward to the first hurdle. Next slide, please. All right, in the next slide, the first hurdle is the farm must be either profitable or have the profit potential to attract the next generation. As an example, I'm currently working with a farm. Uh, it's a vegetable farm that's a combination of wholesale and retail. Uh, this is the third generation that's been at, at the farm and they've been actively going. The challenge is that they have not adapted as quickly as necessary to go from wholesale to retail. Uh, uh, as an example, I've worked with them to try to take a look at their earnings. And over the last three years, they've averaged only about $10,000 per year in net earnings before paying themselves. Not enough to really continue going forward. Again, they've got to figure out how can they make the farm more, more profitable. Well, the next thing to take a look at is if, you're, if your farm is already profitable, that's truly wonderful. If your farm is not profitable, how can you make some changes? What changes can be made? Uh, another person I've worked with, I know very well, originally his operation was a dairy farm and as many of you know, the dairy industry is facing some challenges. It's had cycles up and down. What this gentleman did, though, is he switched from being a dairy farmer to being a turkey farmer, raising turkeys, selling them at uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, having ice cream and having a farm stand, has gone from a business that uh, was financially okay to a business that's done well. So he's made some of the other changes. What other changes can be made to make a farm operation more profitable? Work with another farm operation. It's a farm stand and a greenhouse operation. And they do okay at this point, but they were looking at how can they grow the business? How can they be more successful in the future? They're looking at things as simple as parking. Uh, they are in a relatively metropolitan area, currently have about 50 parking spaces. And during peak time, uh, there's just not enough parking spaces to go around. They are looking at a basic plan, changing it from 50 to 85 parking spaces. Well, you can imagine if you increase nearly double the parking spaces, how many more people can come into the store, get people in and out more easily, opportunity to be more successful at that. Now, some people will say, well, I'm going to get out of wholesale because it's not as profitable as retail. Uh, some people have that retail mindset where they can work with customers, they enjoy the customer contact, they enjoy marketing, and there's some who have the wholesale marketing who maybe grow a very good crop do a good job financially, but don't like dealing with customers. So to make that transition from wholesale to retail, some people can do it, some people can't. So where are you in that first hurdle? Do you have a farm that's profitable? If yes, move on to hurdle number two. If no, what changes can we make? Do you need to change your product? Do you need to go more from wholesale to retail? Uh, are there some twists and tweaks that you can make to the operation that you currently have? Let's move on to hurdle number two. Next slide, please. All right, you've got a farm that's profitable or there's a way to make it profitable. Now comes the next step is are the farmland owners ready or almost ready to make that decision? Uh, next slip. What's holding them back? And this has been one of the challenges that I've had is I get very eager to help farmers uh, who are looking to transition. Uh, it's a scary thing for them. A lot of these farmers have been farming for 30 years, 40 years. They've been the face. They've been the voice of that farm. That is what, in many cases, defines them. That's farmer Joe down the street. He's got the best sweet corn in the, ro in the world. He does a super job on his lunch sandwiches. Whatever it is, they be you become known by it. To make a decision, to make a change uh, is very difficult. First item is age. How many of you feel, well, I'm still too young to stop farming? I I'm not ready to make that change. I visited somebody two days ago. They're 82 years old, and they're still playing basketball uh, two to three days a week, including full, full court. Uh, is that person too, too young to retire? Uh, his children are in their late 50s, so it's probably time, but uh, age doesn't seem to be holding him back. I had one gentleman I worked with, a successful farm operation, so they met hurdle number one, but uh, they felt too young and didn't want to make any transitions. Met with him several times, and I put together two succession plans. He had an attorney who was two weeks older than he was and had worked with her for years. She put together three plans, uh, retirement plans. He said, yeah, 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 yeah. Finally, by that fifth plan between the two of us, he was turning 70, and suddenly within a few months, 
he transferred about 80% of his net worth, transitioned the business to his uh, son, who was uh, early 40s at that point. That was a trigger, uh, was the, the, the shift in age. That's what, when he decided it was time to go. Uh, sometimes age, you know, unfortunately is tied in with health. When people feel good, like my basketball player, uh, they don't feel the need to change. The challenge with that is that uh, if suddenly you're not feeling well, if you have a heart attack, you have a stroke, or some less significant issue, you break a leg and you're not able to work, suddenly it goes from a nicety, yeah, I should think about um, transitioning my farm someday, to I need to do it yesterday. And that's the difficulty is that change then comes very fast. The senior generation is probably not ready to do it that fast, and the gener next generation uh, who is interested in taking over the farm may not be ready that quickly. So health, a lot easier to do it when you're healthy, when you're younger in age to make the changes, uh, do it on a more gradual basis. Next thing that may be holding them back is uh, family dynamics. What is the relationship between husband and wife, whether the husband's operating the farm or the wife is operating the farm? Is the spouse ready to uh, be moved towards retirement? Do they want to continue? In most cases, the spouse is more than ready to uh, transition the farm, but I've had a few cases where the spouse can't see any option and likes continuing it. So the spouse is a very important in that decision. Uh, where are the kids? That's another challenge, especially when there's some farm children and there's some non-farm children trying to figure out how can you be fair between the farm kids and the non-farm kids. Another challenge in this second hurdle is the fear of making the wrong decision. What if I have to give it to the child that's farming currently and one of my other kids decides to come in farming? Or what if the, the child that's farming right now, I give him everything and he decides to move elsewhere? So that fear of making the wrong decision, a number of people, because of that fear, will make no decision at all. And to me, that's not a wrong decision. That's, well, sometimes that can work, but that also can be dangerous, is making no decision that could be the wrong decision. Fourth, uh, a fourth item is being unsure of what retirement will bring. That is also very difficult uh, for people. Um, I worked with one farm. I was actually there this morning. Uh, there are several siblings in there. One of the sibling, siblings, on, this is a dairy farm, uh, he has been the cowman for many, many years. And he told me very proudly at the last meeting that I've only taken off 10 days in the entire last year. Uh, this gentleman's mid-60s. Health is not so great. Uh, but being proud of that, you know, good for him in that he takes a lot of pride in it, but it's also not healthy in that as health declines, uh, being able to do something else is just going to be more and more difficult. So uh, what will retirement bring? That is a tough one. Last one is much more of a soft, uh, touchy-feely issue, but it's in many ways one of the most important is personal relevance. I can remember many years ago, my dad sold his uh, dairy cows in the buyout program. And I remember shortly after the cows had left the, um, the farm and were traveling to the, uh, the slaughterhouse, he stood in the driveway. He was 62 years old at that point. And he kind of looked around and said, I've done this for 40 years. Now what am I? I worked so hard on this farm. Cows are gone. You know, am I still a dairy farmer? Am I a retiree? Or who am I? Uh, difficult to see. And it's a reality for many people. But uh, that personal relevance is... Uh, very difficult. A lot of people, as I said, Farmer Joe, Farmer John, they are defined by who they are. And when they are no longer the leader on the farm, uh, it's very difficult for them to define themselves, especially if that's been their primary focus over the years. So second hurdle is, are you ready? Or are you not ready? If you are ready, let's move over to hurdle number three. Can flip to the third, next slide, please. All right, now the farm's profitable. And the senior, senior generation is ready to start the, the process. They've made a decision, it's time, or it's time to start the transition process. We now get to the third hurdle, the landowner's financial ability to retire. And this is financial, which is a topic everybody hates. This is the one that they can talk about the farm, they can talk about the products, they can talk about their family. That's all well and good. The financial side of it, that's like pulling teeth. First item I will ask them is, do they, do they know what they need to uh, retire on financially? Uh, a lot of you on this call, I'm sure, the farm pays for certain items as personal expenses. Many of you may have a, a farm vehicle that's used as a personal vehicle. There may be some gas pumps that are filled up. 
if it's a livestock business, some of the meat that you're enjoying in the evenings comes from the, the farm. Uh, electric meters may cover both the house and the barn and are called a business expense. A lot of things like that go on. I'm a tax specialist, so I try to tune my ears out on that, but that's something that uh, is a reality of life. Well, once you retire uh, and you're no longer necessarily involved in the day-to-day, -day, now you've got to figure out what source of their income you're going to have, how much do you need to live on. A lot of people will say, I'm going to be on the phone. I'll still be around. I really don't need much. My kids are up and grown. My groceries are low. Well, in the hundreds that I've done over the years, I would say the range that I've seen is somewhere between $45,000 per year on an annual basis up to about $125,000 per year. It depends on the family size. It depends on the location of where you're at. Are you in a metropolitan area? Are you in a rural area? It also depends on your medical costs, which is one of the biggest ones. And it also depends on what you want to do in retirement. Do you want to travel? Do you want to collect items? Are you very generous with gifts to your family? Are you gift generous with uh, gifts to charity? What defines your living needs? And again, generally I, I ask people to be fairly liberal on this because they, if they're in their 60s, a very good chance they could be living for another 25, 30 years or even longer than that. So selling themselves short on what they need, not a good item. I work closely with one farm who I've worked with for many years. Uh, we t talked about how much they're going to need. The parents kept saying over and over again, we don't need much money to live on. They had a gravel pit on the, on the farm operation. Uh, this was a, a heifer boarding and composting business. And they said, we don't need the gravel. Son, you take that business uh, or the proceeds from that business. Son said, you know, I really don't need it. I'd rather you have it. And they insisted that son take it. Well, son started taking the proceeds, uh, geared up the farm a little bit based on those proceeds. Within six months, mom and dad said, we don't have enough money to, to live on. I wish we'd kept the gravel proceeds. After I told you so, uh, we made a transition. The son was gracious about it, but he told me, you know, I wish they'd done that up front so that we didn't have to change midstream. But again, making sure that's, that's covered. So what do you need? Uh, many people have spreadsheets that will detail how much is for medical, how much is for gifts, how much is for food, how much is for utilities. You can find these uh, sheets on the website, but again, I think it's important before you retire to really get a good sense of how much it's going to take for you to live comfortably in retirement at your current living standard, if not a little bit higher. All right, you figure that out now. The most typical I've seen is somewhere between 70000 and 80000 and for discussion today in this webinar, I'm going to use 75000 Next step, you look at what do you currently have saved for retirement? Uh, how much do you have in liquid assets? And that could be IRAs. It could be 401ks. It could be your uh, stock and bond portfolio. It could be some cash or some CDs that you've set aside. That's part of your uh, funding for retirement. You then take a look at the retirement income streams. You look at Social Security. You look at your retirement funds, you look at those stocks and bonds, trying to get a sense of where you're at. As an example, let's say between husband and wife, uh, they, they're getting about $30,000 per year in Social Security income. They also have about $400,000 set aside in, social, in um, uh, retirement funds. Oh, a rule of thumb that uh, investors, financial specialists often use to make sure that you don't run out of money is to take a 4% return on that investment. So you got $400,000. Uh, you get, if you figure out a 4% return on that, that is $16,000 that you can take every year, essentially for the rest of your life. Likely you may be able to take higher than that if the stock market and the markets are a history, but if you use that 4%, I think you're pretty safe. Okay. You now have 30,000 social security. You've got another $16,000 from your IRAs. And let's say you've got another, uh, so that's uh, 46000 And let's say you've got another $100,000 in CDs and uh, other assets that you could put in the stock market. 4% uh, of that is another $4,000 per year. So you've got 30 in Social Security, 16 from your retirement funds, another 4000 a year from your other savings. That adds up to be 50000 Now, remember, we talked about that you had figured out you need about 75000 total. Take off 50,000 from sustainable uh, sources. That means ultimately you're going to need about $25,000 per year from the farm in one form or another, either a sale of the farm, 
rental of the farm or wages that you generate from the farm. You've gone well on your way to try to figure out what you can do, what you can't do. Now, the next trick is can you afford to take less for the farm than fair market value? Let's say your farm is worth a million dollars, just picking a number. Let's also say that based on our first hurdle, the farm is profitable, but it's not really profitable enough to have somebody pay a million dollars for the farm. Let's say it's only worth 800,000 instead of a million dollars. With those proceeds from that, again, in theory, will you be able to generate enough money to uh, retire on? And again, if we use those simple 4% calculation, let's say you sell the farm for uh, 800,000, you have to pay 200,000 to Uncle Sam, so you got $600,000 left to put into your stock portfolio. At 4%, that'd be another $24,000 per year. You had 50 already, you need, you're gonna have another 24,000. You've reached 74,000 or effectively your retirement plan. You're not above it, but you're right there. So something to consider. So this is the third hurdle, is taking a look at, can you generate enough money to live on and or how much do you need from the farm ultimately? All right, you're moving forward. Now let's go to hurdle number four. You flip the slide. This is the next trick to it, is finding the right, right one for, the, for your operation. Now, is it going to be a family member? Is it gonna be a non-family member? Well, most people start with the family and if they find the right one, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about what is the right one, uh, that can work very well. It can also have some challenges. Uh, if a family member is not involved, uh, then you may need to move on to a non-family member. Uh, I worked very closely for several years with somebody who ran a combination of a cheese business, dairy, wholesale dairy operation, and a composting business. They were very successful. They were ready to retire. Um, they had the abil financial ability to retire because they had done very well. They then looked to their family members. Uh, this individual farmer had three children. He had one uh, child who was working full-time in the business. He had one child who helped out on occasion. And he had a third child who was not involved in the business. He went, he and his wife talked to all three children. The one that was there full-time, she was a manager of the cheese business. She said, I wanna be involved in the cheese business, but I do not wanna be a manager. If you decide to sell the farm to somebody else, I'm happy to work for them, but I do not wanna be the owner and in charge of that operation. So she was ruled out. The second child who did some repair work and other work, worked part-time, he said, I enjoy helping out, but my full-time business is, is construction, contracting. I love that. I like being on the farm, but that's not my passion. I'm not interested in taking over the ownership. <clears throat> third child was a school teacher, lived a little further away, had no real interest in it, uh, other than enjoying coming back when uh, they came back from time to time. So they ruled out, they looked at all their children as the first option. All three children in discussion said, thanks, but no thanks. The one child said, if I can work for the successor, wonderful. All right, they moved to, eliminated the family. They then decided it's time to look for some non-family members. This is a challenge that needs to be done. Um, with a business that had several different facets, the dairy on the wholesale side, the cheese on the retail side, the composting business was just starting up, so it was a new marketing and strategy. They were looking for some, uh, the right type of people to, uh, that could handle the different skills. They were ideally looking for a couple. Where do you try to find these type of people? Uh, in their case, they went towards dairymen from the dairy side. They went to a number of cheese publications at another side and they actually hired me to work within the farm credit system, work with a number of people within the ag industry, use the internet, um, and we put together an entrepreneurial uh, flyer discussing the farm. They had a uh, PowerPoint presentation on the farm operation itself, and they had hired me to uh, field calls to attract people from different areas. We attracted several hundred people. Some were tire kickers, some were wannabes, and then there were a few that were serious. But we had a few that had some potential, uh, did a fair amount of due diligence on them, asked for resumes, asked for their histories, asked for references, and then had a number of conversations with them myself. Once I had vetted the people to determine whether they had some potential, we then got together with the farm operation, with the farmer, uh, had some discussions. Uh, they got a chance to visit a few times. Uh, to see if it was a fit. 
we had one couple that was very close, but they just uh, didn't have the financial wherewithal, a little bit too young, just weren't quite there. We found another couple that had some experience. Both of them had come from farm operations. Uh, both of them had done fairly well financially. Uh, up to that point, they were approximately 30 years of age. We gave them an opportunity to come to work on the farm as on a trial basis. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out too well. <laughs> in this case, uh, the husband decided he knew better how to run the farm than the farm that had been operating it for 40 years, uh, countermanded some of the uh, agreements, and uh, didn't last too much longer. The continued to the search a little bit further and ultimately discovered a young couple, which uh, of all things, uh, they were totally unrelated to farming, but they had terrific work ethic. They had terrific interest in learning. Uh, while this discussion was going on there, they would often come at four o'clock in the morning, make the cheese, uh, do some of the milking, and then go on to their full-time job. Through this effort, through the search, through the discussion, found a super, super couple, to make this thing work. So a lot of due diligence, a lot of uh, effort to see if it was the right fit, uh, and ultimately was very successful. By having non-family members, uh, the benefit there is that it reduces the family dynamics. Uh, this uh, farmer's uh, children are all, all happy to see how the operations proceeded. The child that worked for the cheese business is still working for the cheese business, working out very, very well. So there, going back a little bit, the family members, there is a benefit. Uh, in having a family member, you know them, uh, good or bad. Uh, you've got a sense of where where they fit maturity-wise, skill level-wise. Um, there can be drawbacks to that. If you have family members who are okay but not good, uh, do you make them the, the future owner of the, the farm? That can work very well. It can be a major detriment. Generally, if you have family involved, you're more willing to reduce the price, like I just talked about, going from a million to 800,000, which you may be less willing to do if it's a non-family member. But it's important to take a look at the pros of the business and the cons of the business. I work with one large wholesale garden center. They had two children in the business from two brothers, uh, both of them in their early 40s. When I first talked to them, they talked about, hey, our kids are going to be the future of the business. We just need to do the transition to them and life will go on. Well, going through the conversation a little bit further, uh, it fairly quickly became apparent the older uh, son uh, ran the cash register and the younger son stocked shelves. So they were involved in the business, but they really didn't have the management ability, nor frankly, did they ultimately have the interest in doing so. So family members were considered in this case, but they moved on to non-family members. So which is right, no, consider family first is generally the, the right idea. If you have family members who have some skills or have potential to be successful, if not, move on to the uh, family members is kind of the, the next step. All right, let's move on to slide number five. All right, you've gone through the first four hurdles we've talked about, and now you're on hurdle number five, reaching an agreement. You've got the farms profitable, you're ready to go, you've uh, decided uh, it's a family member or it's a non-family member. Um, now you've got the last steps of putting together this agreement uh, to make the, the transitions happen. Uh, um, now you've got to figure out what do you transfer? Do you transfer just the operating business? Do you transfer the real estate? Do you do both? And I've seen many different directions. And frankly, in many cases, I'm a big advocate of separating the businesses into these two parts. Just for discussion purposes, let's say we've got the John Jaffe uh, Operating LLC and we've got the John Jaffe Realty LLC. The John Jaffe Operating LLC is running the, my uh, tangerine business and my realty business owns the tangerine uh, real estate. Well, which one do I sell? In many cases, that transition of, okay, I'm going to transition my operating business Maybe I'm going to bring a new person, family member or other in as a partner. Uh, they come in, they own a part of it. They buy in a little bit further. And a few years later, the plan is for them to take over the operating business. I continue to own the real estate. And maybe I collect that $25,000 shortfall I need between my retirement funds, Social Security, and what I need. And then ultimately, as time goes along, if they do a good job, if they have the financial ability, well, maybe at that stage, I'm ready to sell the real estate to them, maybe at a, at a discounted price because they've done a great job, 
and they want to hire me on a part-time basis to provide uh, consulting advice, con provide advice to them. We've worked out a deal. Is it going to be successful? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but if you you have somebody that has a potential opportunity, but is not quite there financially, doing it on a more gradual basis is probably a good thing. So look at the options. Some people have the financial ability to buy everything. Every case is different. All right, you're going to look at that. Oh, they have some financial ability, but they don't have full financial ability. Are you willing to take seller financing back? Selling that farm for $800,000 because I think they, I'm giving them an opportunity. They are able to finance $500,000 with farm, cre farm credit, but that uh, they can put $100,000 down, which means they get 500 from farm credit, 100,000 from their pocket. They're $200,000 short. Am I willing to take back that $200,000 in sell, uh, seller financing? Well, the benefit obviously is if they can't get 700 out of the 800,000, they can't do the deal. So the benefit is that by providing seller, seller financing, uh, this person has the opportunity to buy the operation from you. The second benefit is by not collecting all the income up front, you may be able to do this as an installment sale and potentially you can defer some of the taxes on it. So another benefit of doing it and you're helping that farm operation out theoretically. Drawbacks to it. Well, if everything goes well, life is good. If they have some financial difficulties, well, if there's a $500,000 mortgage on that farm and you are behind 500,000, the only way you can collect your 200,000 is paying off that first 500,000, something you may not want to do. That puts seller financing at risk. One way to mitigate it to a certain extent, ideally is to get a bigger down payment or get to a price that maybe you can afford it and you're willing to walk away. That farm we talked about for a million dollars, let's say they try to, uh, they, they want to pay you the full million dollars. You know that you know, if you got $800,000, you're satisfied. Well, under this case, if the last 200,000 is seller financing and it doesn't work out, well, you've gotten your 800,000 already, you haven't gotten the full million, but you may be willing to uh, walk away from it. So uh, seller financing has some strengths, has some weaknesses, something to discuss. What's a transition timetable? This can be all over the board. Um, my ideal, and I've told this story many, many times, is for the senior generation to start when they are somewhere between 55 and 60. They've been operating for a number of years. They've done pretty well financially. The farm is profitable, uh, and they're looking to that next generation. Younger generation is 25 to 30. They've been around for a few years. They graduated college at 22 plus or minus, and they've been around for three to five to seven years. They've got a pretty good sense of what the farm is involved with. Uh, they've got a pretty good sense of the profitability of the farm, hopefully, and they've got a pretty good idea, is this the future for them? Take them at that 55 and 25, and let's do this transition over a 10-year period. This is my pure nirvana. What that means is that that senior farmer starts at 55, and by the time the transition plan is done, they are 65. Those young farmers have started at 25 or so, and by the time they are fully in control of the operation, uh, they're 35 years of age. Did this specifically with a uh, pick your own fruit operation, and over a 10-year period, the senior generation plan was to transfer 10% per year. 10 years at 10% is 100%. Ultimately, that's what happened. Some of the real estate was transitioned, and at this stage, senior generation is collecting a nice rent from the real estate. Younger generation is operating the farm, doing a super job, by the way. A very gradual, very nice transition. Quick story on this, I went out to this farm, and about seven or eight years into it, uh, son was running the operation primarily, doing a super, super job. I grabbed a deck chair with the owner. We went right to the middle of the chaos, sat down, he had on a wide brim hat, kind of hit his eyes, and he looked around and said, this is just perfect. I get to see my next generation kids running the farm. I get to see the happy customers. I get to do what I want, which is back in the fields, away from customers. He said, what a perfect transition. So in this case, a 10-year transition was not intimidating. He could see the future. The junior generation had time to learn their skills and ability and pick up the skills very nice transition. Does that happen most of the time? No. But if it can be at least a five-year transition versus a one or two-year transition, and ideally being 10 years, 
gives the senior generation the ability to look to see what their future is. Are they going to travel? Are they going to be involved in the farm? Are they going to be collectors? Are they going to start a new hobby? Junior generation, it's not as intimidating. I'm going to have to take over tomorrow and I have to make all the decisions. Far less intimidating. So the longer that uh, transition period is, the better off they are. Another thing I advocate is who should be part of this transition team. In reality, in most cases, it's going to be a consultant or somebody that has some expertise in this uh, area, typically an attorney to do the legal documents, loan officer uh, in many cases, uh, if you have some financing, and not on here is accountants. Uh, it's a whole team of people. It's important to work with all of them. And I've found over the years that sometimes it's good to get them all together, maybe not at the first meeting, but early on in the process because the reality is they're gonna probably have to talk to all of them. And if you get them all in the same room, you may say, oh my goodness, just think of the per hour rate. On the other hand, if you're gonna to have to talk to them all anyways, you're gonna to have to pay them all anyways. If they're all in the same room, they can ask questions of each other, all hear the same thing. And that way, if there's any changes or switches, they all know it right up front. Uh, you don't have a change by one that you have to go back to everybody else. So using a team, I found can be very, very, uh, very successful. It is costly. Transitioning planning is not a cheap process generally, but it's one of the most important things you're going to do. It's transitioning assets that you've worked a lifetime to grow and achieve. If it's a family, it's a critical family dynamics, or if it's non-family, you may very well be working with these people. If it's a gradual transition for many years, take the time, use the team, spend the dollars, and do it right. All right, we've gone through the fifth hurdle. Now, the other part of this equation, uh, flip the slide, please, is that next generation. You've gotten yourself ready. You've got that farm profitable. You've picked the people out. Uh, you know what you want to do. But at this stage, you want to make sure, do they have that ability to, ability to succeed? Hopefully, you've vetted them earlier in some of the due diligence. Maybe they're most of the way there, but they're not quite there yet. Um, Take the time to figure out what's the, what's the plan and get them started. Uh, do you need a training plan? One of the things Farm Credit offers is a Generation Next class, classes, which is a three-day seminar. Uh, first day on leadership and management. Second day is on financial and uh, financial analysis and management. And the third day is on risk assessment and work-life balance. Many, many other courses out there figure out which ones are important to them. Another thing you need to look at is that next generation, do they have the financial ability to acquire the business in real estate? It is so critical for them to understand what the finances are, how to deal with lenders, how to budget, how to maximize the income, how to minimize the expenses, trying to figure out how can they do that. They could be the best grower in the world, but if they don't have the financial ability, uh, this is not gonna work. So. Look at courses to help them, uh, send them to training on QuickBooks, for example, uh, to help them make that happen. Last item, I'm a big fan of the business plan, and I've written a number of them. I've worked with a number of people. I've put together templates and PowerPoints on what, uh, what's the best way to do it. I love business plans because, again, it forces a candidate for your farm operation to put on paper what their vision is. You may be a dairy operation. They've envisioned the, envisioned the farm as a beef operation. Uh, you may be mostly wholesale. Maybe they're looking at retail. By asking for a business plan and insisting on it, it forces them to take a look at, okay, if I have an operation that's not the same as what I'm doing currently, uh, uh, what's going to be the income? What's going to be the expenses? Are they going to generate enough income? Are they going to be able to pay me if I've taken back some seller finances? Are they thinking clearly and straightforward? So having a business plan, should it be retirement if you're uh, either family or non-family? I'm a big proponent of it. I'd like to see it happen. It tells me a lot about the candidates, the ability to think, uh, both about the overall operation and financially, which, as I've said, is very, very important. Last slide, please. Bottom line is getting started. We've talked about the five hurdles. You need to start with step number one, to, number one today. I would encourage you to do it sooner than later uh, because the easier the, the sooner you start, the better the transition is. It's an exciting time to do this transition to farming. It's a terrifying time for both the senior and the junior generation. Don't put it off, get started. 
You can have some leisurely conversations, both with uh, advisors, with family members, with non-family members. Get started sooner and move forward. And with that, I'm opening it up for questions. Well, that's great, John. Thanks so much. Uh, I think some great insights there on this process. Obviously, uh, with the examples you've given, you've uh, obviously worked through a number of situations. So, um, uh, so some good examples there and food for thought. So we got a couple questions in which I'll get to. Uh, if, if there are others who have questions, uh, as I said, on, the, on your GoToWebinar uh, control panel, there's a, a red arrow at the top. If there's a question pane. You can type in a question. Um, probably have uh, time for a, for a few more. Uh, I want to start with one, John. You I don't think you got to it directly, but it's kind of implied in what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's kind of that worst case scenario where there's, you know, the, the current operator uh, passes away, and then the yep. farm may go right to the non-farm spouse who, you know, may or may not be ready to deal with that, or if it's a, you know, a single owner and they pass away. It, what kind of things do you do from a, uh, from, you know, preparing for that in terms of a will, for example, but mm -hmm. if you don't already have kind of the succession plan queued up, what would that, you suggest? That can be a, a big challenge. I worked with one recently. Uh, the owner was 92 years of age, and the uh, person who was a non-family uh, successor was 30, uh, 30 years of age. We actually got to the point that uh, we had it put it in his will that if he sold it uh, through his will, uh, the uh, the person that was currently uh, operating and leasing the farm had the ability to buy it for about 30% less than what the farm was at currently. And you may think that's kind of crazy, but uh, the farm had been owned for many, many years, had a very low tax value. If the farm was sold during their lifetime, um, they would have paid a lot of taxes on it, several hundred thousand dollars, to the tune of almost 30% of the sale price. But if the person passed away with the tax laws, uh, the value of that farm steps all the way up to its fair market value, there would be no tax on it. So we set up a plan so that uh, if it went during the lifetime, the price would be higher. If it went during their estate, the price would be lower. The other thing we did is we had the 92-year-old farmer who frankly was up uh, repairing shingles on their porch roof, so <laughs> they could live to be a, a hundred plus. But they had a conversation with their uh, six kids and said, this is what we're planning on doing. This is what we'd like to do. None of the six kids were interested in the uh, operating itself. They were interested in the proceeds, but they were respecting dad's wishes and uh, were fine with his flexibility to have it for a period of time and have it sold through his estate. So there are ways think, to, to... Go ahead. Yeah, there are ways to do it, but uh, it does present some challenges. Well, and what I think I hear you saying is that sort of preparing for that ultimately sort of requires you to think through what you you, you would do in, in that situation. So That's exactly right. You can also put in whatever agreement you have if you've reached this, uh, this uh, hurdle number five and have come to an agreement. You can put in there that this agreement is binding upon the current owners and their heirs. So that mm -hmm. would then go through the estate plan process. Okay. Well, you, you mentioned something that one of our other questioners asked about, uh, which is in terms of uh, tax liability. So it, in terms of the, the tax implications of these kinds of transfers, mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how is that dealt with? They, they ask specifically, um, you know, do stock transfers or, or putting the assets in an LLC or, or a trust, um, you know, Obviously, hard to get too deep into that topic, but maybe if you could make a general comment on on, on how the issue of, of tax liability for these types of transitions is dealt with. Sure, no, that's absolutely appropriate. And this is where I go back to my team of uh, team of uh, people working there. If you have an accountant, both the person that's looking to uh, transfer the operation, they can get a sense. Okay, I saw that operation for eight hundred thousand. I'm going to have two hundred thousand dollars in taxes. I'm going to be left with 600000 That's what I got to invest. The account may say, well, if you do it on an installment sale and take that money over the, a number of years, your capital gain rate may be lower. You will pay less tax on it. Same goes on the other side. The person that's buying it, they're going to take a look at that farm operation. They're going to allocate that purchase price between the land they buy, between the buildings they buy, between the equipment. 
they're going to want to have as much value on stuff that they can depreciate and as little value as they can on the land. So oftentimes it's negotiation between the, the buyers and the sellers, senior generation and junior generation, because tax can have a ma uh, major uh, effect on it. So taxes, and again, if the farm has been known for many years, most of you know that you try to write off as many things as possible. What happens is that your tax value in the property and the business is fairly low. Any sale price is oftentimes taxable. Okay, great. So uh, on hurdle five, you mentioned uh, the issue of which assets to transfer. And, and there was uh, an interesting question came in that um, had to do with, it's really a consideration in terms of, I think, non-family members. They kind of gave a specific example where there are some non-farm assets, for example, say a camp that might be mm -hmm. associated yep. with the farm in a kind of a specific situation where w when the camp, when the, when the overall farm was sold to uh, a non-family member that essentially the, the, the new owner kind of considered the camp as theirs as well, and the non-farm heirs did not have access to it. It's kind of a specific example, but I guess it sort of brings up the general question, of, you know, how do you deal with situations like that where you know, we think of it as the farm assets and the land and the buildings and, and the equipment, but sometimes that there may be other assets uh, uh, with it as well. Well, this is where it's absolutely critical to have a, ultimately use lawyers to clearly define uh, what is a what is going with the sale, what is not going with the sale. With that cheese dairy operation that we had, uh, some of the equipment was being retained by the current, the former owner to operate the the composting business. Uh, most of the equipment went with it. We went as clearly as uh, the cheese that was in inventory versus the milk. Uh, we even went as far as they had a, an old truck uh, that had a uh, tailgate with a name on it. The uh, former owner wanted to keep both the truck and the tailgate. So they specified within the agreement, which was about 52 pages long, uh, exactly what was included, what was not included. Last thing now, you want to have here is, is uh, hard feelings on this or misunderstandings. Right. Now, it takes a lot of work, but then it avoids confusion and ambiguity later on. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, there's, and there's, uh, yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, and there's many creative ways to do this. I work with one operation, which was a transfer of a cider operation. And the uh, senior generation who was exiting from that operation wanted to get paid uh, for a period of time. The way they did it is that in the first year of, after the sale, they got paid 1.5% of gross sales from that uh, cider business. Second year, they got paid 1% of cider sales. And the third year, they got paid half percent of the cider sales. This was a great deal for both sides because the new acquirer didn't have that much experience in, in, in the, uh, the cider business. So they were looking for that expertise, but gradually phasing that off as they became more expert. And this, the one that was selling it looked for that income to help uh, supplement the income that was coming through there, but phase that out as they got involved in other, other parts of the business. So there's many different ways to be creative and put the agreements together, but again, they've got to be well-documented, minimize uh, misunderstandings or potential conflicts, especially with non-family members. Right. And, and so I think the example you just gave is one where obviously a very detailed plan got put together. So actually a question came in is what, what kind of budget should someone assume for the process? And, and I realize it's gotta be case by case, but maybe a range or give people a sense of, you know, in terms of the team that you put together, uh, what, what might that cost? I would say as a general parameter, somewhere the lowest I've seen is about $6,000. And that's a very simple plan, again, for the consultant, the accountant, the attorney. Uh, generally, the higher end runs to about fifteen to $20,000. Uh, but it can run quite a bit higher. The one that has the, the combination, the cheese, dairy, and compost was probably closer to thirty to forty thousand dollars. Again, many moving parts, uh, many pieces that were in part of the process, seller financing, a lot of stuff going on. Uh, okay. Again, probably two million dollar operation. So even if you spend you know twenty twenty grand on a that's a one that's one percent of the total assets you spend on the legal. So in right. terms of what you're transferring, still very small percentages, relatively small dollars. And similar to the example you just gave, uh, someone asked a question about uh, calculating the share of income uh, during a transition period, and you gave a specific example, but uh, is there sort of a standard formula? Um, 
you know, you mentioned one, but, um, you know, is, what's the rule of thumb or how, how do you kind of determine what's the right amount in terms of income or revenue sharing during, during, during a transition? It's really, it's, it's, there is no formula per se. It's sitting down uh, with both parties ultimately. I always sit down with the senior generation first because top priority is making sure that they are financially comfortable. So it is truly a case by case. How much do they have in Social Security? How much they got in funds? How much flexibility do they have? Uh, how anxious are they to get out of the operation? I've had some that say, I'm just done. I want to be gone. I'll take a little less money for it. I'm just finished. Others uh, have more time to look at it. So really is no formula. It's sitting down with the team, sitting down and going through the numbers. Painful sometimes because it's forcing reality. It's digging into numbers, which most people don't like doing, but it really is a case-by-case -case basis. Right. Well, it gets back to kind of that uh, one of the first hurdles in terms of making sure you got a profitable business there. So, yes, absolutely. Um, so I, I think uh, we've got just a couple more questions, and then we'll wrap up here. Um, you mentioned an example earlier where someone uh, was able to bring in a non-family member, but talk mm -hmm. a little bit about the search and the process there. Uh, someone, um, you know, someone had written in in terms of basically operations that they're familiar with having difficulty with that process and in that search of, of identifying a, 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 an appropriate uh, non-family member. What are some of your recommendations or thoughts there? Well, it, it is intimidating for people if the word gets out that their farm is for sale or that they're looking to transition. A number of people are very private about, you know, not wanting everybody to know. The reality, of course, is that you do want to be able to find the best successor that's out there. Sometimes it's word of mouth. Uh, who do you know? You know, having an open mindset to ask friends, neighbors, uh, bankers, uh, lawyers, accountants. You know, is there? I'm thinking about my putting my farm up for sale. I'm looking to sell my operation, keep my real estate. Do you know of somebody? It's looking at trade journals that mm -hmm. that are out there. What's what's the appropriate trade journal? There's uh, a number of uh, websites that are, that are out there. Uh, Land for Good, who I work with quite a bit, has a farm finder uh, uh, website that's out there where you describe the farm operation. Uh, you don't even have to put the name to it specifically, but you put a contact in there. So if somebody's interested in that, uh, they're able to contact that website and make that happen. And I believe there's a Hudson Valley farm finder as well that I'm aware of. So, yeah. okay, that's good. Um, so what if you have a, what about the situation where you have a family member not capable of running the farm, but wants to take over the farm and, and you know, wants the, the income that would come with that? Those are the very, um, the very difficult conversations. I work with one farm operation. There's eight children. One is currently operating it. Three other ones have worked there from time to time. The one that's currently operating it is competent. The others have certain skills, but they don't have the overall ability to make it happen. This is where creativity may come in. If you have you know, one child that's competent, you've got some others that are maybe a little less competent. Maybe they all get involved, but it could be at different ownership levels. It could be that the, the child that's the most competent becomes the president and the core leader of the business. And the other ones uh, may be involved in the business, but have lesser roles. And frankly, sometimes get paid less. This is another topic that is hotly contested is if you have several children in the business, should they be paid the same? Should they be paid on uh, skills and expertise? Hard conversations to do. Uh, I've heard the term recently, prune the, tr prune the family tree. Basically meaning that you figure out which children are worthy, so to speak, and which children are not. Very, very difficult conversations. This is where people often hesitate because they don't want to tell that child, you know, I love you, you have some skills, but you don't have enough skills to operate the business. Those are tough conversations. Sometimes they'll bring in somebody like myself, basically to pass that message on as a third person. Okay, so we're coming up to the top of the hour. We have, uh, I'm gonna do two more questions, so, and then we're gonna have to cut it off at that point. So the first one, John, is, uh, Simple question, can we gift the farm to our son? Absolutely. Under the current federal rules, federally you can give $11 million per person. So unless the farm is worth more than $22 million for a couple, 11 million for an individual, that can be done. Most cases, it's, it's, uh, there's some, it's, 
the transfer is somewhere between a fair market value, what the farm's worth, and zero, and that's called a, a partial gift, partial sale. That will happen, but under the rules, yes, you can uh, give the full ownership as long as it's less than that uh, $11 million per person. Okay. All right. And then last question, um, it kind of goes back to the question, the, the, the one I asked at the, the beginning of our Q&A session here, is what if the next generation uh, dies before the transfer is complete and the plan is interrupted? And I think they're talking about the next generation as opposed to the senior generation, but then you, but the, the, the third Ooh, yeah. generation is already in the business. That can be can be very difficult. Again, this is where you try to look at all the contingencies up front. One of the ways to do that is if you've got the, the generation entering and they pass away first, oftentimes the ones that are selling it, especially on an installment sale, may put life insurance, key man life insurance on that person. If that person is 30 years of age, 35 years of age, my son's 33 and for a million dollar policy costs them 500 bucks per year. Uh, if you got the successor in there, you put a policy that helps pay off the, the deal is a way to do it. Again, it's got to be crafted very carefully up front because you never know. It's more likely the senior generation is going to pass away first, but uh, as we all know, that's not always, not always the case. So drafting it, looking for contingencies, doing a SWOT analysis. What are some of the weaknesses? What are the threats that could be out there? Look at all the possibilities. Great. All right. Well, with that, John, I think we're going we're gonna to close it off, but I want to say thanks to you for sharing your insights. Your passion for this subject, obviously, is evident in, in terms of uh, wanting to help families work through these situations. So, so we thank you for joining us today.